Okay, so as I mentioned before, our real focus here is going to be uh, the big ones. Epidural abscess, dissection, and ischemic bowel. So we'll start off and you can see what I've done is I've taken that studies elements in data points and moved it to the top. So you can go across the top there and see the radiologist MMR, the radiologist productivity and work units per hour, right? You can see everything that went into this, uh, the patient demographics, the apportioned liability, the chances of a successful trial, et cetera. All right, so this is our first one in epidural abscess. And the thing I noticed about the epidural abscesses that were missed is in both cases of the CTs that were missed, both cases definitely have extra spinal findings that should call your attention to the epidural space, right? And in this first case, it's that prevertebral edema. It's really quite striking on both the axial and the sagittal. The epidural density itself is pretty hard to see. It's thin, it's anterior, right? But a very meticulous evaluation of the spinal canal is called for when you see that kind of prevertebral edema. And here were this patient's bone windows. You know, there's some disc space narrowing, a little sclerosis of the end plates, uh, but it's really not that striking. Right. And again, there you can see the epidural density. This is a tough call, but that prevertebral uh, edema may have helped. So I have reproduced every one of these reports with total accuracy. So where it was possible, I just copied and pasted. Otherwise, I just typed it and transcribed it word for word. So this was the complete report, and this is not a great report. Uh, this patient came back with that. So total destruction, discitis, osteomyelitis, and now that epidural density, uh, which you can see on the soft tissue windows, is quite thick and quite apparent. So Ed Calloway, ah, footprints all over VRED, uh, he came up with a system for grading reports. And so what I did when I was compiling this is I took all of the 45 reports that we were going to review, and I gave them to Ed anonymously and just said, have your reviewers score these reports. So all the reports will be scored on the following 10 points and whether or not you complied with those points generates your score. So this one got a six out of 10, which is a bad report. It's not structured, it doesn't address a clinical concern, there are no pertinent negatives and they don't cite comparisons. So not a great, uh, not a great read. So what happened with this patient? He came in initially with neck pain after falling asleep on the couch. The CT was read as normal, and he was discharged by the PA with a diagnosis of spasm. So two and a half weeks later, he returned to the ER, was discharged without imaging and with the same diagnosis. And another week later, he came back to the ER with ridiculous symptoms. The repeat CT, as you saw, showed extensive osteomyelitis and an epidural abscess, necessitating anterior discectomy and evacuation. He had a six-week hospitalization and came away with residual upper extremity symptoms and some incontinence. The estimated verdict in this case was $500,000. The chance of success was given at 60. And the apportioned liability for us sharing, obviously, with the other physicians involved was 65%. And they have a formula, which is you reverse the chance of success, convert that to the chance of failure at trial, which would be 40% here, you multiply that by the apportioned liability and multiply that by the estimated verdict and you usually have your share of the estimated settlement. So that's how they typically do that. We came up with 125 as the estimated settlement here. And as you can see at the top, the indemnity paid was actually $47,000. So we got off actually easier than we thought we would here. The doctor and the PA. So these are all direct quotations from deposition documents or reports of counsel. And I will apologize up front, there's some comments in here. I'm just reporting facts, folks. Uh, there's some comments in here that prompt me to think, huh, what an ass uh, about the lawyer writing it, or sometimes what a sleaze. <laughs> but uh, these are direct from the depositions and I thought it was helpful to show you the kinds of uh, thinking that went into these lawyers' decisions. 
So I don't think it unreasonable. So I put it in red if it's against the defense, and I put it in green if it's in favor of the defense. And so there was some uh, finger pointing, as they say, and the uh, referring clinicians just said, hey, we relied on the radiology report, not unreasonably. So why did we get off easy on this or for less than we thought? Well, the plaintiff was not working at the time of the alleged incident. The plaintiff has been convicted of drug possession and shoplifting, and the patient's medical records indicate he has hepatitis C. So no one actually came out and said it, but it's pretty easy to read between the lines here. This patient was an IV drug user who developed an epidural abscess, a common complication of that particular activity. And so that probably helped them to knock down the indemnity here significantly. All right, next one. This was the $6 million case that uh, they insisted on taking to trial, disastrously so. It's another case of a spinal epidural abscess. This one, I think, more apparent, but similar to the previous case, there is an extra spinal finding that should call your attention to, hey, something infectious is going on in the spine. In this particular case, it was a septic, arthrit uh, a septic arthritis of the facet joint. There's a little abscess adjacent to the facet joint. I didn't even include the bone windows in this because they really were just completely normal. But there was that little enhancing fluid collection adjacent to the facet. But look at that epidural collection. It's really clear. You can see that thickened. Uh, displaced dura and the abscesses on the posterior left aspect of the spinal canal. Right? And it's even uh, visible there on the sagittals as well. So here was the report for this one. It actually it wasn't that bad a report from our uh, standard. Obviously, this doesn't take into account the accuracy, but it had structure or it lacked structure and that was all. And truly, it's uh, it's done in line by line macro fashion, which is, if, as far as I'm concerned, shows a regimented search pattern and uh, is equivalent to a structured report. But as you can see, all we called was a paraspinous soft tissue abscess and didn't call the epidural. So this patient came in at 5 p.m. with left upper extremity weakness and fever. The CT was interpreted as a paraspinous soft tissue abscess. This was a prelim. The final was red and was not materially different. Uh, over the course of all the cases that I did, we read about 50% prelims over that time course. And about almost exactly, in fact, 50% of these cases were prelims. And so I determined that really a prelim, the fact that a study is a prelim is not any kind of protection against being involved in a lawsuit. And of those cases that made this list that were prelims, Half of them, the overreader issuing the final the next day missed the finding too. The other half of them made the finding, but communi didn't communicate it to anyone, didn't call anyone, just put it in the uh, EHR and walked away. So those are uh, how prelims uh, end up on the MedMal list. So ultimately, then at 10 o'clock the next night, the neurosymptoms had progressed and he had to go to a decompression surgery. The patient is now a partial quadriplegic who is wheelchair bound. So the estimated verdict was 5.5 million, pretty accurate estimation given how things uh, played out. The chance of success, 60, a portion liability, 40, and our estimated settlement was 1.1 million. We actually had an offer on the table for 1.5 and I, arms waving and voice screeching said, take it, it's right there. And I always remember uh, one of the other doctors on the panel said, well, I, I think we should take this to court. And I said, have you looked at these images? And he said, no. And that's what we were dealing with. The jury verdict was $14 million. And if you do 40% times 40% times uh, 14 million, you end up with 5.6 million. So that was our portion. The trial judge, this was an unusual case because uh, in almost all states, with the exception currently of Kentucky is the only one I know for sure, there are a few others that are trying to do this. Uh, all the other states have said that QA data is not disclosable, right? is not to be taken into account for medical malpractice proceedings. But 
somehow they got a hold of our QA that said this was in fact a miss. And they, the judge actually uh, ruled that it was allowed. And that was the basis for our appeal and that was uh, rejected as well. Interestingly, the expert did opine that the total recovery, even with immediate diagnosis, would be an unreasonable expectation that didn't seem to mitigate things uh, with regard to the jury award. All right, so the third epidural abscess is actually an MR, and this demonstrates what I call the total reversal phenomenon, and this happens uh, with epidurals and meningitis. It happens with anoxic injury to the brain. We've seen a recent case of that. And it happens with MR of the bone marrow, right, where you have complete replacement of the normal marrow fat. In all those cases, the radiologist looks at a T1 and it's so abnormal, it looks normal, right? And the T2 similarly. And then you look at the enhanced and you just don't click. You just don't connect the fact that you're looking at an enhanced MR. And that's what happened here. So you can see the T1 looks pretty normal. Now there is, ultimately there is an epidural abscess behind C2 and C3 up there at the top. It's a little hyper intense on the T1 and you can get a, a sense that it's up there on the T2. When you look at the contrasted uh, image, it's pretty impressive. You can see the enhancing, the uh, rim enhancing fluid collection there anteriorly at C2, and the entirety of that spinal canal is enhancing, right? That's all abnormal. In fact, this patient had a thoracic spine and a lumbar spine as well. All of it looked the same. The entire spine was enhancing with infectious uh, myelitis and meningitis. So here are the sinews on that, but you can see how that was missed. And so the bottom line is always make sure you know you are looking at an enhanced image and that you're seeing the appropriate distribution of high and low signal intensity throughout. All right, so here was the report. It says right there in the clinical history, patient being evaluated for epidural abscess. And yet there is no abnormal signal in the spinal cord to suggest hemorrhage or edema. It gets an eight out of 10 in terms of reporting content. So this patient came in at noon with left upper extremity weakness, fever and confusion. All the brain, CT and L spine were read as normal. The final reads at 8 a.m. the next day, oh, sorry, it was at midnight. At 8 a.m. the next day, it was overread and also misread. Ultimately, a local neurosurgeon got involved at a different facility, and he finally said, you've got, this guy is just going south and you need to transfer him. So that night he was transferred and ultimately operated on at 10 p.m. The patient's quadriplegic and wheelchair bound. He had a long and uh, horrible hospitalization with all kinds of complications. So our estimated verdict on this was nine to 10 million, chance of success 50. Apportioned liability, we got 100%. Uh, what that was based on, I could not discern, but our estimated settlement was 2.25 million, and we got away uh, really light with less than 500,000 as our indemnity here. So it ultimately did settle. This patient uh, was apparently an incredibly nice guy. He had a wonderful wife. I, I like that comment there, the, the jury will like them. Uh, and then there's kind of a neutral statement about the presiding judge and the juries tending to be relatively conservative. And then there's the scary comment at the bottom that there were adults with uh, subacute epidural abscesses that settled for many millions in the same region. So people were pretty concerned. Uh, apparently, this patient, was his job was he was the producer of Christian documentaries. And so I don't know if that meant he was particularly tolerant and forgiving, but uh, he actually just took a half million dollar settlement for this. 